Now, when we're looking at who are the people who are going to require treatment, you find that we have to, first of all, start off by telling these patients that it is important to have some moderation or uh, an alteration in the way in which they are um, going about their activities of daily living. You find that we would encourage them to consume large, drink large quantities of fluid because you find that it will help. We will also instruct them to ensure to prevent the urinary tract infections, even though it sounds counterintuitive. You want to ask them to consciously go and empty their bladder every few hours, thereby preventing the possibility of urine retaining, possibility of urinary tract infection, and the possibility of the bladder hypertrophy and trabeculations happening. You find that we would also ask them to avoid agents which would cause the alpha-1 receptors uh, to go into hyperactivity, so products like caffeine are to be avoided. You find that all these would also be uh, instructions that would help these patients. You find that in all of these patients, we would also like to do a urine analysis because we want to make sure that there is no urinary tract infection. The PSA, which has been spoken about, it can be increased in cases with a prostatic hypertrophy. And you find that we are not using PSA as a landmark or as a guide for determining treatment plans. It is more often used as an indicator for prostatic malignancy. Now, here is the paradox. An elevated PSA can identify a coexisting prostatic carcinoma that would not have been flagged in the routine course. And therefore, we include it because we want to make sure that we are not missing an associated uh, prostatic malignancy. So you find that the screening for prostatic, and, uh, for, for prostatic carcinoma, it, it is not within the purview of this topic, but you find that if you are looking at men more than 50 who are expected to live for more than another, more 10 years, then they would be the patients that you're going to add a PSA. You find that if you're looking at a patient who's 45 years, who have a first degree relative already identified, that would be a case where you would look at a PSA. You find that you would do a PSA in a man who's 40 years because he's already had one prostate cancer in the family. So that would be, so it's 40, 45, and 50 years of age when you are looking at the evaluation. So you find that when we are talking about the ultrasound, you find that in these patients, when you are doing the ultrasound, not only are you documenting the prostate size, you are also looking at what we call as the post void residue. Now, for those of you who've heard lectures on hernia, very often they tell you that you look at the post void residue, and if the post void residue is elevated, you find that that you would treat the prostate first before you actually treat the hernia. And this is a clinical pearl worth remembering. It is also important for us while doing the ultrasound to look for other things. You don't have to be focused only on the prostate that you don't look at other symptoms like you would also look at any other reasons for a prostatic, for, for a bladder outflow obstruction. And this is particular in a patient who's having uh, hematuria when patient has a concomitant history of urolithiasis and you find when there is a history of upper urinary tract infections. So you find that when I am looking at what are the tests, I just recapping these tests before we go on to the treatment just as a form of uh, reinforcement. So one, you do a digital rectal examination to document the prostate size and any kind of contour abnormalities. You find that you offer PSA when you think that if there is a need. You need to document the symptoms based upon the International Prostate Symptoms Score or the AUA score. And you find that you also ask about what we call as the optional test, like the Euroflow, the Euroflow metry, uh, and also you look at the bladder neck manometry in indicated cases. We do a cytology and um, sensitivity of the urine 
and you can also include cystoscopy of the urinary tract. Now, the reason we include cystoscopy is that sometimes there can be an association of a urothelial malignancy coexisting in these patients. So my professor used to say, when in doubt, shine a light. So always include cystoscopy in your armamentarium, especially when hematuria is indicated. You find that when there is an associated hypertrophy and uh, when there is a prostatic hypertrophy and there is a suspicious area on an ultrasound imaging, it is possible for us to combine a biopsy in these patients. So once we have made a diagnosis of prostatic hypertrophy, and we feel that these are patients who will benefit by some form of therapy, even after the, the symptoms are not relieved by all of the lifestyle modification methods that we had indicated, like asking the patient to uh, you know, have frequent micturition, then there is a case for using medical line of management. So at this point, I will reiterate some of the points that I spoke about in the pathophysiology. I told you that the reason, one of the reasons for an increase in the prostatic volume was the increase in the DHT levels. So you can use agents to reduce DHT. What, res what is responsible for the production of uh, DHT? It was the conversion from testosterone to DHT by the enzyme 5-alpha reductase. So it is possible for me to go ahead and use an agent to inhibit this 5-alpha reductase. I also told you that we have alpha blockers, which are smooth muscle uh, contractors, which are present in the uh, bladder neck. So you can go ahead and use alpha blockers, all right? So these are the commonly used drugs in the medical management. And you'll find that the use the alpha blockers. Alpha blockers go and block the alpha receptors, which is responsible for the increased tone of the muscles. And you find that we have a whole group of alpha blockers. We started off with phenoxybenzamine, which was a non-selective alpha blocker. Now today we have an alpha-1 blocker. Alpha-1 blockers can be classified as the short-acting as well as the long-acting alpha blockers. So you have prazosin, alfuzosin, indoramine. And when we're talking about a long-acting blocker, we have terazosin, doxazosin, and alfuzosin within a sustained release form. Now you also have a finer division of that when we call about, we refer to it as the alpha-1 agent, and we have the tanzilosin, which is what everybody nowadays uses, along with the silodosin. And it is also possible for me to use a combination of a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor along with a combination of an alpha blocker, either with a, you know, either with uh, either you know a selective or a non-selective alpha blocker. So this combination works very, very well. Now, you remember at the beginning, I said that there is also another component of the metabolic syndrome, which uh, kind of is believed to contribute to the hypertrophy. So in all of these patients, it is very, very important for you to control their diabetic status. So if patients are diabetic and they have a BPH also, they have found that a control of the sugar status is responsible with a reduction in the severity of the symptoms. So today we will definitely try with the alpha blocker and with the combination, there is often a four to six degree, a six point improvement in the score in all of these patients who have been uh, treated with these drugs, okay? I am not going into the dosage of all of it, and that will be the learning exercise for you where you get familiar with what are the brands, what are the doses, but just remember that the understand the pathophysiology of how you are going to treat these patients. Now, when you have put these patients on medication and you have followed them for a period of about six months, and in that case, you go ahead and then you take a decision 
whether these are patients who are having an improvement in the symptoms as a result of the medication or there has been no improvement and whether there is a case for indication for surgery. The classical indications for surgery are acute retention, chronic retention, and the presence of complications or when it affects activities of daily living. So what do I mean by acute retention? Suddenly the patient comes into your emergency with acute retention, and that would be an indication that the prostate is la large enough. So these are the patients who come into the emergency room, require either a specialist to pass in the smallest possible catheter into the uh, urinary bladder or failing which, you can do a suprapubic puncture in order to prevent an occurrence of a bladder rupture. So an acute retention is an emergency, requires fixing, and you find that this is something that every uh, undergraduate, every medical officer needs to know how to deal with the acute retention. Now you find that chronic retention on the other hand is when the symptoms are such that the patient is actually not seeking attention or not seeking uh, hospital care or a consultation for the retention per se. But when you are doing an ultrasound, either as a part of a master health checkup or as a result of a, a, a screening for any other procedure, like I mentioned before, for a hernia, you're finding a post-void residue. Normally, at the end of micturition, the bladder is expected to be empty. But what happens in these patients is that it bulges into the prostatic urethra, and as a result of which, the urine is not able to overcome that little bump produced, and as a result of which, there is a retention. And when this post-void residue is greater than 200 ml, we say 150 to 200, you find that that would be an indication to go ahead and fix the prostate. Now, you find that any of the complications that I spoke about earlier, hematuria, the presence of calculi, the presence of trabeculations, you find muscular hypertrophy, you find a hydrourethra, a hydronephrosis. In all of these cases, that is straight away an indication for surgery. So you find that when we talk about surgical options, the gold standard is what we talk as the transurethral rectal resection of the prostate. Now you find that when we were medical students, you find that they used to do an open prostatectomy. Today, we have moved away from open prostatectomy. And today, the gold standard for every patient who has a prostatic hypertrophy is the transurethral re uh, resection of the prostate itself. Now, you find that there are multiple other options that you have, but you find that the gold standard, as I mentioned, is the transurethral resection of prostate. So how do we do this transurethral resection of prostate? You find that we use either a general or a uh, spinal regional anesthesia. It's certainly more comfortable to go ahead with a general anesthesia. And then we use a cystoscope or a working sheet. And in that working sheet, you have a side sheet through which you using a handheld device. It has an attached wire loop. And you find we're using a high energy electrical cutting current. All right. So we have this uh, through the urethra. We introduce this cystoscope. And through that cystoscope side channel, we use an electrical current and we end up shaving off prostatic tissue. Now, as we shave off the prostatic tissue, we have to be constantly aware of the prostatic venous plexus. The whole process is now connected to an eyepiece. You have a video through which we would be able to see it. And today we are even able to connect it to a screen so that the others are also able to see the procedure as the surgeon shaves away. It's, it's like peeling a carrot for lack of a big, better example. So layer by layer, you are taking off shavings of the prostate and thereby you are reducing the amount of the prostate that is present. And very often, whatever has been shaved off is collected and measured. And often they will say, so much grams of prostate removed. And you find that this is the way in which a transurethral resection of 
prostate and stuff. Now, remember that as you are shaving, there's going to be bleeding and this bleeding can obscure your field. So therefore, you also have a side channel where we use an irrigating fluid. And this irrigating fluid helps to clear away the uh, shavings, as we call it. And it also helps to tell you whether there is bleeding present and it kind of helps to clear this particular field. Now, this electrical current is crucial to the process and we can use it to fulgurate even the bleeding spots. And at the end of the procedure, we leave a catheter in place. Now you find that this catheter serves as uh, serves two functions. One, it has a tamponade effect that it prevents minor little oozes that have happened as a result of the disruption of the plexuses. It also ensures that the patient does not have to get up and has some amount of comfort in the immediate post-operative period, all right? So the points to remember, it is a transurethral process. We are using a cystoscope. It is a high energy source. We are using an electrical cutting device. We have a side channel for irrigation. We can have another side channel for the process of having a, a video or, or a monitor. And you find we leave a urinary catheter in place until the bleeding has almost cleared. So this is the way in which we go ahead with the process of doing the uh, transurethral resection of prostate. Now, when I'm gonna be talking about the complications that are associated, I want you to recall in your mind's eye, the anatomy of what I was talking about. So you know that when you were looking at the picture of the prostate, it was very, very close to the sphincter, all right? So we were talking about the perineum. We were talking about the perineal musculature. So when you are shaving away bits of tissue, it can be associated with some amount of incontinence, and that occasionally occurs and is less than 1%. Now, you remember the opening of the ejaculatory duct. And you find that one of the functions of the prostate is that, that at the time of ejaculation, you find it kind of bulges in and prevents the ejaculate from going back into the bladder and it kind of forces it out through the prostatic urethra. So you find the moment the prostate is removed or removed in a little too much fashion, you find that patients can have retrograde ejaculation in as high as 15%. 5 to 10% of the time, they can be associated with impotence. And a too vigorous acuritage of the bladder neck is associated with scarring. And in the late feature, it can result in contractures. The TORP syndrome is when you find that as a result of opening of, of the venous plexuses and you use an irrigating solution, you find that it can result in a dilution. There is more absorption of water, and as a result of which, you can have hyponatremia, and you can also have the occurrence of lightheadedness as a result of the low sodium. But today, when we are using solutions like uh, normal saline or, or isotonic saline, we often don't see this particular complications in the present population. Now, these are more anecdotal in the uh, completion of the discussion of the topic. And you, we used to do a transvesicle, the so-called open procedure used to be done. And today, the, neither the transvesicle or the retroperineal or the perineal prostatectomies are ever done. And I think medical students today hardly see this. This is more of historical uh, application. Now, there are some amount of minimal invasive therapies. Now, when I say minimal invasive therapies, these are indicated in patients who are not fit candidates for uh, anesthesia. Some of them are being tried in controlled settings like clinical trials, and you find that some of them are also experimental in nature. So these are uh, informations that I just want you to listen to and be familiar with them and rather not use it as the first answer in any of your uh, discussions. So you find that instead of doing a transurethral resection of the prostate, you can go ahead and make an incision. This is something like the dorsal slit that we do when we are talking about a circumcision, right? So quite like that, instead of actually resecting 
elements away. You can do it in a patient who is a high risk, who's not going to withstand a long procedure, who cannot tolerate the blood loss. So this is something that can be offered. It's like partially cutting something that's producing a constricting effect. You're kind of opening it out without actually shaving it all up. So lasers are something that are available today, and you find that several forms of laser beams are available for uh, prosthetic management. So you find that the what we call as the KTP laser, the Holmium laser, are some things which are used both as a cutting as well as a vaporizing tool. All right. So not only can you use it as a cutting instrument, you can use it to uh, vaporize it. And as a result of which, it helps to reduce the amount of prostate which is present and thereby reduce the amount of obstruction that is present. So you today, we can go ahead and do what we call as the transurethral vaporization or transurethral ablation using some of these lasers. Of course, when you're using lasers, you need to be familiar with it because there is no tactile feedback, all right? It's a light source and you find that it, it can end up causing perforation in the process of the early learning curve. We can also go ahead and do, do what we call as microwave. So all of this works on the concept that you are using an energy source. You remember when I was talking to you about TURP, I spoke to you about it being an electrical energy. So instead of the electrical energy here today, you can go ahead and use a microwave, you can use an ultrasound, you can use a radio frequency, or you can use a laser in order to create some form of an energy that allows you to peel, shave away all of this prosthetic tissue and result in restoration of the passage. You find that mechanical approaches that are often experimental, again, anecdotal, probably in the con into the uh, paragraph on recent advances, you can talk about the role of prosthetic stent and arterial embolization. So you find that with that, I come to my very last slide. And this is basically a recap or a, you know, a summation of all of what we spoke, about, spoke about. So when we have a patient who comes, the history is very, very important because these are patients who are going to who are going to present either with obstructive symptoms or symptoms as a result of irritation. So you find that the symptoms are going to include hematuria, uh, frequency, hesitancy, straining, weak stream, and you find sometimes incontinence. You find that in these patients, so the very first box right on top. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a direct examination and we go ahead and do a focused physical examination. So when I say a focused physical examination, we are looking at the lobes. And today the ultrasound is also considered as an extension of the patients, of the clinician's arm. We would like to look at the urine to make sure that there is no urinary uh, infection that there are no crystals present, that there is no long standing. And you remember, I spoke to you about the role of the prostate specific antigen in select patients, those with 40, those at 45, and those at 50. Then you find that when there are any kind of symptoms like gross hematuria, bladder stones, recurrent UTI, and renal insufficiency. This is what I refer to as the complications as a result, and that straight away is an indication for surgery. Otherwise, I am looking at the AUA score or the IPS score, and then I'm gonna decide whether the patients require surgery or whether they can be managed with modification of lifestyle, medication, or whether they're gonna progress. So when these symptoms are less than seven, you find that we are basically telling them lifestyle modification. So anything more than eight, then I have to take a call and I have to make sure that there are no other features of bladder neck obstruction. So I will do a Euroflow. I will look at the post uh, void residue. Remember the magic number, 150 to 200. And then we will have a conversation with the patient about the treatment options. So then we're talking about the non-invasive, where we're looking at the watchful waiting or the medical treatment, 
and under medical treatment. I spoke to you about the role of the alpha blockade. I also spoke to you about the role of the five alpha reductase inhibitors. Now, when the patient decides to go in for surgery, then you know it is important for you to actually go ahead and do other tests, including tests of evaluation for these patients for anesthetic fitness. And then I will go ahead and offer surgery. And the gold standard there is the transurethral resection of prostate. What are some of the complications of surgery? One is the occurrence of incontinence. Second is the possibility of retrograde ejaculation. Long-term effects like bladder neck contracture and occasionally the TURP syndrome. The role of minimal invasive therapies is into the uh, realms of recent advances. So with this, I would like to conclude and I will be happy to answer any questions that you might have.